G'day guys, uh, Jeff and Matt from ATP Science. We've got a personalized health summit that we're doing at the Gold Coast Convention Center on November 2nd and 3rd. Matt, what is your personalized health summit all about? Well, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna help you find out where you're at, you know, go through your symptom picture questionnaire, find out what your particular health priorities are. Yep. And then over a couple of days, we've got some great guest speakers coming from everywhere, all over Australia and the world. Um, we've got Rich Kreider coming over, the expert on creatine. Head um, of the ISSN. Yeah, yeah, he's a head of the uh, International Society of Sports Nutrition yep. um, and works with uh, Texas University, mainly the NFL and the American military, those sort of people. So some great knowledge. Grandfather of creatine, actually one of the yeah, guys. Much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a smart, smart guy. Yep, who yeah. else have um, we got, Matt? Simon Hill from Plant Proof. Uh, um, we got excellent, we had him on Fofie, the podcast. Fofi Van Campen Yeah. Um, <laughs> and she's doing some gardening and all that sort of stuff. Um, we've got James Newbury, Kara Saunders. But from what you CrossFit. Do, from CrossFit. So what you're going to do is we're going to go through, find out where you're at, what your particular health priorities are, and then over a couple of days we're going to have all these keynotes speaking, these electives, so you can go and learn about your particular strengths and weaknesses and how to take that to the next level in regards to performance. The thing about the speakers that we've got as well too, it's a real cross section. Oh, don't forget, we've also got um, uh, Liz Lambert as well oh, too. Ken Ware, Ken, Ken Ware. I mean, he's capable of getting people out of wheelchairs. It's probably uh, worth a mention. Yeah, I mean, like the chaos <laughs> theory. I mean, he was on sixty minutes, and, and literally yeah. have a look at some of the speakers we've got. Well, he's Absolutely. changed my life in in six months. So yeah. it's really going to be something that's a bit special, um, and you're going to be able to follow on with your own questionnaire, so that you, when you're listening to the information, you're going to be able to um, effectively effectively uh, help to diagnose uh, your issues or your areas and things that you want to be able to work on. So, And at the end, we're going to get all of these guys together with a big panel for a massive Q&A section. You're going to be able to break out into electives and ask questions and, and learn specifically about you know, di different, uh, you know, different areas that these guys are experts in. So yeah. it's, it's something pretty, pretty different, pretty exciting, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. All right, well, um, jump online to atphealthsummit.com. That's atphealthsummit.com where you can actually learn more. Uh, of course, you can always uh, get in, uh, in contact with us through uh, Facebook and also jump onto the website. There'll be links there as well too. So, uh, Matt. Sweet, see you there. See November you there. 2nd and 3rd. Welcome to the ATP Project. You're with your host, Matt. Steve, and with the magic of science and technology, we've got Oliver Catlin all the way from the US of A. Say Thanks. hello, Oliver. How are you all? <laughs> Thanks for having me, gentlemen. That Thanks, is Oliver. wonderful. And today we're going to be talking about drugs. Yeah. Well, not like last time they said we're going to do a podcast on drugs. <laughs> that was a really weird podcast. I know. I, I did come in with a, with a funny cigarette and everything, and then I got hauled off. It was a bit weird. I thought we were going to do it on drugs. but We uh, were but, on yeah, drugs. The, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so, but today we're, we're going to be talking about... drugs and sport in this conversation. We'll get exactly. Deep. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. It gets well, really heavy. <laughs> we, we do have a sporting competition here in Nimbin, which is a famous town in Australia called the Mardi Gras, and they do do drug testing there, and you have to be positive for cannabis to enter it's a bit of a joke but uh that's the honest thing it's northern new south wales it's called the mardi gras event so. really steve and how did you go <laughs> oh yeah i did pretty well in that no i don't i don't do any of that stuff but 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 there are some athletes who do do some stuff to get ahead in their performance don't they i sure do but hey let's introduce everyone to oliver so let everyone know now oliver can you tell us a little bit about yourself because the reason why I wanted you on the show is because I love the history of science and I love the history of discoveries and I love to know that we're kind of right in amongst everything and have a good understanding of why we do what we do. Now, when it comes to um, drugs in sport and when it comes for testing these sort of things, you've got a decent history there and you kind of know a lot about the landscape, enough for us to talk about the grey area and not just repeat the black and white statements. So w tell us a little bit about your history in regards to drugs. <laughs> just... uh, well, my, my pleasure. It's, you know, I live kind of an interesting history. I was afforded the opportunity to uh, be the son of the guru of sport drug testing in the US, uh, my father, Dr. Don Catlin. So, uh, he's been doing in a dietary world. Well, he's been doing drug testing in sports since 1982. Yep. And uh, so he did the Olympic drug testing in 1984 for the Olympic Games in Los Angeles. Did the ones uh, also in Atlanta, Salt Lake. 
Uh, and he really, you know, built the sport drug testing industry in the U.S., uh, not only doing the Olympic testing, but testing for uh, NCAA, NFL, um, for, uh, and, you know, we got to help start uh, the minor league baseball drug testing program. So we, we're really right in the middle of sport drug testing in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got to go to my first Olympic Games in 1984. And I've been to 11 LA. since as a result mm. of, uh, you know, his work for the IOC Medical Commission. So it's, you know, some people grow up in a family, you know, firemen and police officers, yeah. you know. I grew up under the guru of drug testing in sport mm. and, you know, I'm pretty proud to follow in his footsteps and, you know, apply uh-huh. part of that trade to protecting dietary supplements and athletes and, and so forth today through BSCG. So. So, Today, uh, so I'm you, president of BSCG, and that's am, our seal, that's our brand, and we're out there certifying supplements and protecting athletes from uh, banned substances and other quality issues in the process. So that's the banned substances control group. That's and, the one. And BSCG and you took BSCG for short. Nobody can uh, say it right. Can you say BSCG? Bas- How do you got it? Oh, I prefer Basagurgic, but um, <laughs> but no, the, um, how old were you when you started working in it yourself then? So you've always been interested, but did you know pretty much sure. finish high school and go to, you, you were straight into the into the science of testing? No, I did some other things first and did some financial analysis, worked for a, a, a Vail Resorts playing in the mountains for a couple of years. Yeah, wow. Had a great Jeez. time there, but uh, I've been doing this now for 15 years. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I've been doing it long enough and, you know, I cut my teeth first as the, uh, the uh, 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 administrator at the actual UCLA Olympic laboratory. Yeah. Wow. Athlete drug testing and worked there for three years before really focusing and turning my attention on dietary supplement certification and our other nonprofit interests. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been in it for 15 years and it's a fascinating industry. Yeah. Uh, you know, I learn daily and, and, there's never, never a dull moment. And the it's testing different. itself, I mean, the substances, of course, have changed over the times. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the substances um, that people would be using. But the testing, the technology and the testing must have changed significantly. I mean, the sort of testing your dad was doing, it would be very different to what you're doing now, hmm. wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's been years in the making to get to the point we are today in sport drug testing, which is incredibly advanced. You know, these days we're finding parts per trillion of drugs, you know, in urine samples. And, you know, back in those dark ages when when we were just getting started, uh, you know, they were struggling to find even low parts per million quantities. So, you know, the testing has really improved. The equipment has improved. And, you know, that's helped us, you know, fill a lot of the holes and and deal with a lot of the problem substances along the way. So it's it's absolutely watch that. Yeah. And see it develop. So, great. Now, just to give some context to people listening, parts per trillion. One part per million is one part in a million. One part per billion is one part in a thousand million. One part per trillion is a millionth of a millionth part in the urine. Just to give someone some maths around that. So that's incredibly sensitive. I mean, I speak about these numbers every day, like it's you know, it's my business, and it is. Yeah. But you know, we're literally talking about parts per trillion amounts, you know, a grain of sand in an Olympic swimming pool that you wouldn't see, you know, or less. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. you know, and that's what we're required to find to do, you know, professional level Olympic quality sport drug testing to test the athletes. And when yep. it comes to supplements, we got to be just as good to, you know, look for contaminants and supplements as well. So it's amazing yeah. the science and, and the breadth of it. Uh, and so, the scientists that do it, you know, it's a, yeah. it really is a labor of love. The anti-doping scientists, the committed people out there that are doing the work, you know, it's it's a tough industry, and yep. it, it's really great to have them out there, you know, building those methods and, and keeping sport clean. So. Yeah. Mm. So that now, while you're talking about such minute concentrations, have you ever? I mean, I know you would have, but how does that relate to like naturally occurring? Like, for example. I'm pretty sure like a lot of athletes out there will be drinking milk and that sort sure. of stuff. And, and I know there's hormones and that sort of stuff in milk and, and in the meats and you know, that yeah. sort of stuff. Are, those, are we talking sometimes the same levels that you might find in milk or something? Uh, uh, does that make it a banned substance? 
Like, is there a cutoff level? You're talking about a very interesting area with milk, it turns out, yes. And, you know, whey protein, or probably one of the world's most popular supplement ingredients, comes from milk. Yeah. Uh, So does colostrum, yes. And so, you know, the interesting part about hormones in milk is there's one small little hormone that's pretty prevalent in milk. It's called IGF-1. Yeah. Yeah. And IGF-1 is a banned substance in sport. So yeah. it's kind of the perfect example of how to deal with that reality. Um, you know, there are naturally present uh, banned substances in sport in things as benign as milk or yeah. whey protein. So figuring out how much of a banned substance, uh, you know, is of significance to an athlete and in what type or in what form is pretty important. Okay. So yeah. let's talk whey protein. Yeah. Let's get into. Well, whey protein and colostrum, because I think those two are actually fairly similar ingredients. Yep. But if you look at the World Anti-Doping Agency, the World Anti-Doping Agency in their FAQs has some cautionary statements about colostrum, okay, because it contains IGF-1. IGF-1. The NCAA, our, our college system here in the States, uh, actually lists uh, colostrum as an example of a banned substance you know, uh, in parentheses after IGF-1. They also yeah. list deer antler, okay, which I yeah. know is popular, you know, in New Zealand and other places. You know, it's one of the, the places it came from. So there's a lot to think about in that area. If you've got the World Anti-Doping Agency cautioning you about using colostrum, where's that same caution on whey protein? Yeah. And, you know, what is the real issue? Well. You know, the caution in this case comes from IGF-1 being part of the detection method for human growth hormone. Okay, yeah. we use it as a biomarker. So and it, for indirect detection of human growth hormone. Yeah, and so okay. really what they're driving at is a concern that if you take too much IGF-1, that it could perhaps influence a drug test for IGF-1. Okay, yeah. but the fascinating thing about IGF-1 is that if you ingest it in its whole form, it breaks down into amino acids in the body. Okay, they've done radio studies uh, attaching, you know, radiological signals to IGF-1 to see if it is absorbed intact in the adult human body, and it's not. And so that's part of the reason why ingesting IGF-1 uh, from colostrum or whey protein would not be considered doping. Okay, yeah, if you're okay. going to dope with IGF-1, uh, you really need to inject the substance. Okay, yeah. so it, it comes to a matter of form. Now, it's not always that simple. There's this whole deer antler industry too. Yes. Yeah. And in that realm, you've seen you know liposomal products, right? Uh, yep. We've gotten into a day and age of liposomal delivery, and for your audience, you know that's absorption essentially of larger proteins through the tongue. So you can absorb things without having it be broken down in the gut. Yeah. So, you know, if that's the case, you could actually potentially absorb IGF-1, and you yeah. could potentially be doping. Uh, it became a big legal case uh, with the golf or PGA or the PGA Tour player Vijay Singh. Um, yeah. was accused of doping uh, after admitting to using a deer antler product and he fought you know a five-year lawsuit with the pga tour over that issue yeah. um so it's vital you know you don't want to be accused of doping you know from taking a, a whey protein or colostrum product yeah and it's you know often the lines are just not finely drawn in this industry so when it comes to you know deer antler in an in, or whey protein or colostrum, if you ingest IGF-1 in you know those kinds of naturally present amounts, it's not going to be an issue on a drug test in sport. Whereas okay. if you inject it, or possibly if it's liposomally absorbed, it could be. So yeah, and the, you know these deer antler products are dosed with specific amounts of IGF-1, and there was actually a study done at a WADA lab that demonstrated uh, that oftentimes it's it's spiked with yeah. IGF-1 uh, that's mm. not naturally based. It doesn't derive from a deer antler uh, yep. uh, or from you know the milk 
that's you know naturally contains IGF one one. So it's just really a lot of fascinating things to think about just with that one substance. Yeah, it's it gets more fascinating if if you think IGF one is denatured in the stomach, like a lot of proteins are because of the acid content. But what if you're taking say a drug called Nixium, which is an antacid or a PPI, which <laughs> stops the acid? I mean, maybe you'll mm. absorb more of it. I'm just being hypothetical here. Yeah. Nexium's not banned in sport, is it? Not that I know of. You I mean, know. You're, you're right. And there's a lot of, you know, cross reactivity with drugs. There's a lot of absorption, you know, aids yeah. out there these days, many that are added to supplements to aid the absorption of, you know, ingredients and how those might affect, you know, other things that might be present. It's not always the focus of studies. Yeah, there's a lot, mm. always yeah. something new to learn, right? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Scary, you, isn't Steve it? Up. So with those, you, you mentioned it before, you know, like to, in testing an athlete, um, you know, we're looking for the, the most minute concentrations to see if we've got evidence of them cheating at all. Are you capable of measuring herbal material with the same level of accuracy to make sure that a herbal material is clean before they an athlete consumes it? Because like in a herbal matrix, sometimes they're very what we call noisy you know we get a Sorry. lot of a lot of peaks and everything on these um test results and and in amongst that a very low dose drug um that you know someone might supplement be using a drug at like 0.5 milligrams as a therapeutic dose and it'll be in a herbal matrix where we've got hundreds or thousands of milligrams of other actives are we capable no, of finding right. that stuff no, it, 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 that's a great question, Matt. And it's it's you know not every supplement product and every mix or formulation is the same. Mm. Yes, and when you test athlete samples, you're testing the same matrix essentially in urine every time. You know we're testing yeah. you know hundreds of different combinations of you know matrices or you know yeah. mixtures of ingredients, and so we do constantly deal with matrix interference. Okay, particularly yeah. with more complex matrices. And you can, you know, for, for a, an armchair, you know, person, you can think of mass spectrometry as a series of peaks, okay? Yep. And a peak comes out at a certain time, um, and that's indicative of a certain drug. It also has to, you know, meet a certain size uh, as well. So that's, you know, you fingerprint substances based on these peaks that are presented. Mm. And so... If you have a small amount of a drug, for example, that comes up in the same region as, you know, something that has a larger peak, you can sometimes be blind to small amounts of substances. So, mm. you know, this, that's why in analytical testing, particularly of subs or, you know, dietary supplements, you end up dealing with a, a detection level range often. Um, yeah. And, you know, Sometimes you can see, you know, 95% of the menu at a certain level, but a few other compounds are a little bit more difficult to detect. And so you've got a, a little bit higher detection level for those. Mm -hmm, yeah. So, you know, there, there are definitely differences between products that we have to take into consideration when we're doing the testing. So. Yeah. It's very we, we do a lot of herbal sort of products. And then there's certain ingredients like... Um, not sure if you're familiar with shilajit, which I've, you probably are. Oh, yeah. Shilajit's that, it's that dirt from the Himalayas, but because it's a, it's almost like a, a postbiotic compound, it's got pro-hormones, it naturally occurring hormones. There's a lot of weird stuff in shilajit and like lots and lots of stuff. Yeah, it, it, we, we struggle with a lot of herbal material in Australia. We try to get the tests and, and basically they'll come back and say, we can't find anything. It appears to be clean. We're looking for it, but... There's too much noise, so we won't give you a, a tick of approval. Is that a? But then on the other end, so then there's a lot of athletes and coaches, and they what they 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 do, they make the mistake then of reading the label and looking at the ingredients on the label, and then going to the WADA list to see if those are ingredients are on the list. But you must find a. You must have found over the years there's quite a few products out there where what's written on the label is not necessarily what's inside it. Well, and interpreting what's written on the label is not necessarily always an easy task for laymen or athletes and others. And it's, you know, you know there have been many examples of that. Don't let me get back to Sheila Jim. Yeah. Some stuff on that. But it's good. You know, look, I had I had a, a tennis player, OK, who tested positive um, and called us up after the fact 
and want, asked me to review some of the supplements he was taking. And so I reviewed them and, you know, in 15 minutes, I pulled out the two things off of the labels that were a concern, you yeah. know, cause I'm pretty well versed in what to look for. And he just wasn't. And it's, yeah. hmm. it was just the ultimate exercise. He tested positive for two things yeah. and it was just the ultimate reminder and exercise to me that, you know, you have to, it's the starting point first to look at the ingredients and try to decipher what's on the label and whether or not it, it is or isn't banned. But, it's not always that easy. And mm. we'll get to things like Shilajit and natural testosterone boosters. And we can look at some of, you know, the rating systems that sporting agencies, you know, use to evaluate supplements with those in mind. And we can see, you know, even further examples of, you know, the complexities. Just mm. in the IGF-1 example, you're talking out about a banned substance in some forms and not in others. Okay. That's mm. not written yeah. into the WADA list. Yeah, yeah, you've got to know that and you've got to evaluate that. So it's it, and that's often the case, you know, with with herbal you know, products that you're often talking about active chemicals within those herbal products that are the focus points of the yeah. formulas. But, you know, some of the activity those things could have could also drift into certain categories that are banned in sport. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, when you look at the WADA list and, you know, I keep mine handy. So, you know, yeah. mine's all dog-eared here and there's notes all over it. And so <laughs> but, you know, I keep my WADA prohibited list handy. People need to look at it. Yes. Yep. And uh, people need to read the language pretty closely. Okay. Hmm. There, in almost every category, there's and related substance language. Hmm. Okay. Which, essentially means that stuff in that category that's on the list is prohibited, but stuff that's not listed could also be prohibited. Okay. Yeah. And therein lies the challenge. Okay. You know, if you even want to take that back to a foundational level, you know, the three conditions for listing a prohibited substance on the WADA list are a potential or a proven uh, performance enhancement effect, potential or proven harm to an athlete, and the yeah. third one is whether or not something is against the spirit of sport. Okay. Yeah, right. A very nebulous condition. All right. Yeah. And we're talking about a category of sport nutrition where, where, you know, formulators are targeting performance enhancement in one way, shape, or form, you know. Mm. Uh, and so it's often a fine line, you know, these things that, that are being formulated are obviously not designed to cause harm, so that one's out the window. But yeah. just because something enhances performance, is it against the spirit of sport? How does this all fit together? Yeah. I mean, it's really, mm. truly fascinating. So, yeah. you know, part of what I do, you know, I'm always investigating and evaluating ingredients, yes, mm. in yep. products that we're asked to certify. And one of the most difficult parts of the job is really interpreting the and related substance language with certain product categories okay so rewind you know 10 years and pro hormones were huge in the dietary mm. supplement industry yes yep. these were products that were essentially steroids you know in a different dress or yep. different different pants or whatever you want to put it yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you know, they were steroids that acted like steroids, but they weren't listed as steroids. Mm, OK. Yeah. And so eventually we regulated pro hormones. And, you know, slowly after that, what popped up? But, but SARMs, a whole new category of anabolic products. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, a whole new category of investigational drugs uh, that were designed and looked at for various purposes some of which, you know, ended up building muscle. Okay. So hang on, no, you just said what type of drugs? Investigational. Yes. So no, did you say investigation? So we're talking about research chemicals, like uh, yeah, I mean, not, it's, not f it's, fully established. Like we don't understand the safety profile mechanisms of action and all that sort of stuff a lot of the time. These things are still in that experimental phase, aren't they? That's basically what I'm saying. I mean, in the case yeah. of, you know, selective androgen receptor modulators, SARMs, 
Uh, these things have flooded the dietary supplement market. You can find them online all over the place, mm. you know, from from dicey brands. But um, you know, in reality, they are investigational drugs. They have not been approved in any country as a drug, but they yeah. were developed as pharmaceutical drugs for you know research purposes. So yeah. they just so happen to, in some cases, build muscle, and so they are good you know, potential yeah. alternatives to pro hormones. Yeah. So exactly. it's, it's fascinating to watch, you know, as regulators plug holes like they did with pro hormones, up pop songs. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it doesn't end there, you know, in every world anti-doping agency category of banned substance, I can find you an example uh, of an ingredient from the dietary supplement sphere that in some way is trying to mimic or not mimic, but, you know, has a potential effect that fits that category. Yeah. And figuring out whether those really are banned and whether they're not is, you know, one of the things I really enjoy uh, yeah. about my job because it's immensely interesting, but it is really complex to athletes. And it's also really hard for, you know, the best meaning supporting groups you know, yeah. even, you know, like the global drug reference online or, you know, drug free sport here in the U.S. operates an access program where you can look up, you know, ingredients or, or things or submit supplements and see whether or not they're banned. But oh, good. it's hard to look at these things according to a, a matrix and, you know, always get to, OK, this substance is always banned. This is not always banned. Yeah, the IGF one example shows that, um, and it, you and know, whether it shows up is that is that that would have to be a big part of it. I mean, when you're trying to decide if it's going to be likely to be a banned substance or not, it's going to be is the dose or is the metabolites going to turn up in the urine and because some of these things share the metabolites as well. So you might take a different right. pro hormone or different precursor, end up with the same yeah. failed drug test. Try, try this one on for size. I mean, it doesn't even always have to be from the dietary supplement realm. It can just be from the food realm. Yeah. Meyer lemons. Yeah, you guys got those. You like Meyer lemonade? Yeah, I don't think we do. We, have we don't too. have them here, but no. no, but I've heard of them. Meyer lemons, yeah. a species of lemon. Yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. a citrus species. Okay, well, Meyer lemons naturally contain octopamine. Oh, octopamine yeah, right. Octopamine is a, a banned substance in sport. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I mean, theoretically, if you drink Meyer lemonade, you could be, you know, drinking a small yeah. amount of octopamine. And it's, you can take that example well deep into the dietary supplement realm where you're dealing with, you know, sometimes citrus extracts or, yeah. you know, any variety of plant extracts today. There's, you know, thousands of plant extract ingredients on the market. So it's... Yep. You know, and when the you take that out exponentially, that's why I yeah. say it's so interesting to consider. But it's it's interesting for me at the end of the day to an athlete. It's not interesting if they test positive because of some trace amount of something or another mm. that's in a plant that they didn't know about that was in a yeah. benign supplement. And that's what and that, we're all about protecting yeah. people against. It's We have the expertise to to make sure products that we deal with you know, aren't in that category and don't pose that risk. And, yeah, you know, it's incredible. Other good supplement certification programs out there like Informed Sport, uh, Hosta in Australia, you know, yep. that also provide options in that realm. So. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this gets really interesting because we got these naturally occurring pro hormones or SARMs and that sort of stuff. Um, that people could be accidentally consuming or may not be listed or they may not understand that they share a metabolite. Um, and like we can justify and we can have it, not justify it, but we can have those discussions and feel sorry, you know, for those athletes and go, geez, that was bad luck or, you know, yeah, that sort of thing. And then, and then we can support them in their fights to clear their name and that sort of stuff eventually. But the problem is too, is as within the media too, then, then they start, bag and supplements saying they're unregulated natural stuff's dangerous no one knows what's going on and then that gives an opportunity for someone that may test positive to a, a chemical it doesn't occur like there's psalms out there that are made like you're saying before as research chemicals that you can purchase they're not naturally occurring 
But right. these people then use that excuse to say, oh, no, I consumed a natural supplement and now I've tested positive. It, 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 who's res- this, is a, this is the big problem that we're seeing a lot. The media then just bags natural medicine in general. Never whey right. protein, and by I mean, the way. But, yeah. look, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a part of the dietary supplement industry. We absolutely, you know, we're a supportive part of it. And it's, you know, our part in it is to demonstrate that there are premium brands that really spend a great deal of time on quality control and yeah. protecting their products. And, you know, our seals end up helping to showcase that at the end of the day, you know, by putting it on a product. But it's... You know, we constantly see the dietary supplement, you know, arena assailed by issues in this realm. And it's, Mm. look, you know, 90 percent, what I say, 90 percent of the issues that the dietary supplement, you know, arena is attacked with comes from 5 percent of the brands. Yeah. And it's the brands that make the decision to choose SARMs, which Mm. are illegal drugs. It's. Mm. You know the ones that push the envelope and you know if methylhexanamine is not good enough and they regulate that you know dmaa they'll go find dmba and dmca yeah. and ha and yeah Z, i don't think za is out there yet but yeah. it's coming yeah yeah um, yeah yeah you know and that's yeah. you know so you know that's why i enjoy doing this work is to be a part of you know representing the good side of the dietary supplement industry that's you know, often lost in those those media sort of storms. Well, we're the ones and, doing the know, testing, so yeah, exactly. Sure. I mean, the, the other thing too is is that if you know, really, if you compare the dietary supplement industry and food, okay, you know, food actually has less controls and regulations than the dietary supplement industry does, as my friend Rob Wildman reminded me of yeah. uh, in a great presentation that he did. But um, you know. Look, it's in the dietary supplement realm. You've got to report adverse events. You've got to do, you know, individual batch testing as part of quality control. You've, you're, you've got to test raw materials when they mm. come into the facility to make sure they meet specifications. And yeah. it's all that is part of dietary supplement regulations, which we call good manufacturing practices. Yeah. Sometimes people see the GMP seals on you know, products, some of those, you know, are kind of invented, but, yeah. uh, you know, GMP is, is essentially the law in the United States now, and all products in the U.S. have to be manufactured according to good manufacturing practices. It's, so, it's amazing. It, it really is incredible. You're right how they are regulated like that. And, and in Australia, you were mentioning SARMs before. It's been in the news a lot here lately because one of our swimmers, uh, Shana Jack, was uh, found to test positive for uh, anabolicum, which is, of course, is a uh, SARM. And it was, it was tested A and B samples, and she's waiting for a decision from WADA. So she's claiming her innocence, of course, and she's innocent until proven guilty. But, I mean, this is a problem because let's say she accidentally consumed this or you know let's assume she did then her career for the next four years is over so it's Ah, quite scary and and Mm. so it's quite hot news here in australia but the thing is yeah sorry you go over oh what i was going to say about it is i mean the the dose for legandrol wasn't it yeah legandrol uh, so legandrol is like 0.5 milligrams to two milligram dose um you know if what i'm curious about is just say um they were to buy a food powder, like a mushroom powder or something like that, that they're going to spike up their foods. And would you, in your opinion, be able to find um, legandrol spiked into a mushroom powder or something like that if it was oh, yeah. tested? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we find SARMs, you know, fairly regularly. So let, me, let me dive into those issues for you with some examples because, yep. you know, you're talking about it from the athlete perspective. Look, we've, we've helped athletes in with testing after the fact, so I certainly understand the ramifications and, you know, the deep personal effects that athletes feel after it. You know, they're accused of being dopers. They spend years of their lives trying to resolve the situation. We helped Jessica Hardy here in the U.S. Uh, years ago when, when she tested positive for clenbuterol from a supplement. And, you know, saw the effects that that had on her um, and and all the work she had to do to resolve it. But, you know, I've also worked with brands to resolve these situations. And so Mm. we've seen brands that are 
completely confident in their quality control situation and in schemes, you know, end up with, you know, trace minute parts per billion quantities show up. They have no idea why. And it, it is, you know, just completely confounds them, you know, mm. and really deeply bothers the brands as well. You know, committed yeah. brands, you know, it impacts them. I don't want to say nearly as much as an athlete. Because I don't want to really compare those two, but brand, you know, brand owners take their brands very personally, and it's hmm. you know, it, it becomes an extension of themselves in many ways, and it's you know, they hurt too when supplement issues happen. So you know, let's look at some reasons why. Okay, I, here in the U.S., I dealt with you know a case with a, an NCAA athlete who had tested positive for Ostrom. Okay. Uh, <laughs> This happened to be Will Greer's case. It's been widely oh. publicized. <laughs> and Will had, ironically, he had admitted to taking a product. It was LGD-4033, okay, which was one of the code names for Legandrol. Uh, you named the other ones. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so he just didn't realize that what he was buying as a supplement, it was in a supplement package, was actually a selective androgen receptor modulator, yeah. its arm band and sport. Okay, and it happened that this uh, Legandrol product ended up being contaminated with significant amounts, if not being mostly Osterol. Okay, yeah. which is another SARM. SARM. Yeah. Um, it's not like these products go through a great deal of quality control. So sometimes mm. they're the real substance they claim to be. Sometimes it's a mix of that and another SARM, you know, can be a hodgepodge. So at any rate, in his case, it was a, a, a question of not understanding what he was taking. And Matt, to your point, I, I can't crawl inside the mind and know if that was an invented excuse or not. I'll, you know, yeah. I'll let you comment on that. But it's yeah. it's obviously <laughs> a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, but you can test for it like a. But that if if a company if so if you're an athlete and um, you got to be really really careful about what you're taking. If you, you see just because it's like a food supplement mm. or like a mushroom powder that's sold as a stock or something like that that is going to improve your well-being, or they might talk it about as a nootropic or an adaptogenic or might might make performance enhancing claims. But that the problem is you said it yourself. Like those food things aren't regulated and looking for these things plus you can eat much larger doses of a food and have a minute contamination that you're taking in a large and suddenly get a therapeutic dose because you're eating well, it and, like a food and you look know? it's you know athletes are subject to drug testing so minute trace amounts that are present in urine you know may not have any pharmacological toxicological any kind of actual effect mm. but you can still find a remnant in urine that yeah. leads to a positive drug test. So it's most of the time, or at least, you know, not always in the case of SARMs, you know, which are people are taking yeah. for the active benefit of them. But yeah. when you're talking about true contamination, you know, it's most of the time the athletes aren't getting a benefit. So mm. look, I talked to you about one example, but I dealt with another NCAA college case here. And the father tra tracked back the supplement, talked to the supplement manufacturer, okay? And this, the owner of the brand, you know, there's a lot of co-packers and manufacturers that make products for mm. brands, okay? So the brand uh, had started to be concerned that the co-packer was dabbling in SARMs, yep. okay? Yep. And it so happened that one of the owners of the manufacturing facility uh, had decided to make SARMs in this manufacturing facility uh, after hours, okay? Yep. And so they didn't follow good manufacturing practice, quality control, cleaning procedures, and the first run batches the next day are mm. highly subject to contamination. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, in that case, it's, it wasn't even known to two of the owners of the manufacturing facility. Oh, wow. So it's, that's just an example of how the situation can be out of a brand owner's hand and yeah. how sometimes the manufacturing can infiltrate uh, or, you know, contamination can infiltrate a manufacturing facility without some of the owners there even. Being yeah. Infected. But it's, 
you would be fascinated all the reasons on why contamination exists. Oh, I, okay? I can it's, imagine. It's, you know, we, we dealt with the case that I really think speaks to this, okay? So yeah. the active ingredient in this product was a mineral, okay? And it came from a mine. And yeah. so all of a sudden this ingredient starts coming up positive for uh, a stimulant, okay? Or it happened to be for DMBA, okay? Yeah. Dimethylbutylamine, uh, which yeah. is methylhexanamine's cousin. Okay, mm -hmm. it's fascinating. So this company did a ton of work to try to figure it out before they came to us. And their other lab was finding this stuff in like plant material around the mine. And they went to the mine and sampled stuff at the mine beyond just the raw material, it, you know, that was at the manufacturing plant being put in the product. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm like, hmm, I happen to be doing some other work and I, I chased this thing down and it ended up being a pesticide and an herbicide okay huh. and in today's day and age you know there's a real push to get away from chemicals okay you know their wellness and you know it's a push push for natural you know yeah, whether yeah. it be in the supplement industry or anywhere else okay and that same push is happening it turns out with pesticides to where they don't want to use harsh chemicals and they're looking for natural like pheromone alternatives and things like that well it turns out some of these chemicals that are extracts from plants yeah. have that benefit of being an herbicide or a pesticide. Huh. And so... Bloody hell, you water your plants with amphetamines, you're going to get busy bloody bees, all right, aren't you? <laughs> Absolutely. You're running around well, off Give chops. me some ideas. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it really struck me because it's... Unless you really are in this industry like me, you're not presented with that kind of a reality on a daily basis. And yeah. you know, even for you guys as brand owners who are deeply involved in this industry and really do care about the quality, it's you know, I'm sure that kind of a reality is is an eye opener. Well, especially it's, if it's all natural. I mean, mm. like for us for you know, we might want to go and say we want non GMO, we want, you know, organic herbs and stuff like that. But to think that someone might then use a uh, a natural alternative that might contaminate it with something you would never have expected in a million years to turn up on in that herb like that is it, that's it fascinating me, it, it honestly it blew me away and it, it's you know that's yeah the, that's the reason why we do what we do you know people yeah. want to try to simplify this problem at times and say oh it's a raw material issue and oh we need to get better ingredients and it's Chinese ingredients or you know yeah whatever yeah. you know and that's not really the case always it's there's there's so many different ways that contamination can infiltrate the industry take you yeah. know you mentioned plants yeah and you mentioned you know we talked a little bit about she legit but there's you know any host of plants that are out there you know doing dealing with natural testosterone boosting and yep. so forth Oh, right. ec ecti phyto ecti steroids in quinoa, for example. Thank yes. you, my friend. You know? sterols, yes. And, you know, what those are are essentially plant steroids mm. in a yep. very, very simplified fashion. You know, if you look at an anabolic steroid, it's, you know, a connected group of, of you know, octagons, not octagons. Be be benzene rings, yeah. What are, yes. Benzene rings, rings. yes. Yeah. So it's a ring structure. Mm. And a plant sterile, all it is is just some more advanced groups that are hooked to the top right of this advanced structure. It's not that different than an anabolic steroid that are yeah. banned in sport. Okay, but it's in five percent of the plants on Earth. It's like sure, I mean, crazy. There's things yeah. like turkesterone or, or mm. a, 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 I can't remember the a juke uh, a and brain, yeah, beta ectizone. So those are the mm. kinds of things that are being put in supplements are looking at natural alternatives to anabolics, okay? And it's they really are interesting to consider. Uh, there's a whole group of science that looks at natural plant sterols, whether they could be anabolic or not, how much mm. anabolic activity they could have and so forth. And, mm. you know, whether those things are banned in sport is really an interesting interpretational area. And how, I mean, how could that, like, mm. like if, if you take the example of 20 alpha hydroxy ectisterone or the, the beta ectisone, where they compared that and found it equivalent to Nerobol with its anabolic effects, and then made a comment that it's 5% of plants on earth may contain it. 
Um, I mean, how would a company, uh, how, how would an athlete or how would a company work with something like, if WADA were to add phytoecty steroids onto the list, do, you know, I mean, for example, yeah. if I was to, we don't have um, peanuts and dairy in our manufacturing facility because in Australia we have to put on the label may contain traces of nuts or allergens and dairy. Now, right. if I was to make psalms out there after <laughs> hours... I don't have to put on my label may contain traces of banned substances because I do that on the same lines. Because but, of a phytoestrogen, a phytoesterol. Yeah. I mean, but we're we're talking about reality in mm. the world today. Okay, we talked mm. earlier about the sensitivity of drug testing. We're we're getting more and more and more sensitive every day. In the yeah. Jessica Hardy case that I mentioned, you know, she tested positive for parts per trillion amounts of clenbuterol. Clenbuterol is one of the easiest drugs to detect. You can go down the, you know, the lowest levels in sport drug testing can be applied to clenbuterol, all right, yeah. which, may, which puts parts per billion levels in a supplement or in meat, as it often is blamed on, as a potential mm. cause. And it's, you know, Alberto Contador, you know, fought his whole case in the Tour de France when he tested Bot positive product. clenbuterol, and he blamed it on meat. During the court yeah. of arbitration, you know, legal case, they said no. The most likely source was probably a supplement. But it's, you know, we are thinking in the anti-doping community as well that there is coming a time soon where our methods could detect small amounts of almost any banned substance in anything. Yeah. Okay? And I'm gonna really blow your mind in a second on a reason why, but. Um, you know, if you if you start to worry about parts per trillion levels in everything and parts per billion levels yeah. of banned substances in food products, think about this, okay? Water treatment. Mm. Water treatment doesn't get rid of the remnants of you know mm. drugs. No. You know completely, okay? Uh, I live downstream. I'm here, here in Los Angeles. I always like to tell people, you know, there's one city that puts more water back into the Colorado River system than it takes out, and that's Las Vegas. And you guys <laughs> yeah. put that together as to why. So, yeah. so I'm downstream. I don't like drinking the water here, but it's because I think about that more than anything else. But yeah, yeah. think about that from the standpoint of the remnants of drugs. Okay, mm -hmm. and now connect this also with countries like China, where they do make a lot of raw materials in China. And I don't know what the state of water treatment is in China, but they have a lot of industrial production of drugs. Yeah. Okay. And so you can see where I'm driving. You know, you can, yeah. here in the U.S. Uh, and even the World Health Organi Organization set limits on things like cocaine and drinking water. Right. Yeah. So parts per tr trillion levels are insignificant. Yeah. And so we're starting to have to think a little bit about that in the banned substance realm and starting to think about lower limits to drug testing thresholds in urine yeah. so that we don't test athletes positive because of environmental contaminants. Yeah. And thankfully, sport drug testing you know, experts and professionals are already doing that. Um, mm -hmm. You're seeing examples of it with things like clenbuterol, where it's starting to be treated a little bit differently in sport. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we have to not only get better at testing, but we've also got to think about those things. And it's, you know, that's kind of the ultimate mm. example, water contamination and the potential for water to be contaminated with low levels of yeah. industrial, you know, drugs that are produced in China and maybe they get into the dietary supplement realm through just that's crazy extracts mm. you know, real benign ways that you know you really wouldn't think could contaminate products you know take you, you yeah. mentioned phytoestrogens right I mean so anabolic steroids you know are still being made in production uh, you know for certain purposes right so yeah. it's like boldenone are still yep. used in you know meat Cattle. fattening yeah. and whatever in certain places okay so they used to make boldenone by synthesizing boldenone okay but they realized that it's actually more efficient to produce boldenone through micro biological transformation of what 
plant sterols. Plant sterols. Yeah, yeah of course exactly. they do. Exactly. Yeah. So, yep. And the urolithins. Um, yep. It's an industrial practice now. Yep. Uh, you know, in making of anabolic steroids that starts with a benign, often benign, not prohibited in sport, you know, plant sterol and ends yep. with boldenol. Usually you yeah. take that too. down and you don't stop that microbiological transformation. Or even if there's a little bit left, who's to say it's not going to transform that plant sterile into something that could be banned? Exactly. And that's what you see in things like Shilajit, where you have the well, sterols naturally <laughs> occurring, you have the microbial fermentation and enzyme degradation and the end result of a naturally occurring hormone or a... Or a a postbiotic, almost, you might want to call it. <laughs> she, she legit is a natural mm. anabolic, and you guys have it in one mm. of your products. I mean, it's. Yeah. I don't want people to think that it's a banned substance. It, it is a natural mm. anabolic. Well, we do sponsor some athletes. Off. It's fascinating. Yeah, I know. Um, and it's, you know, you know, we've actually just certified uh, a she legit ingredient provider. Yeah. Um, because of the questions that are often asked surrounding Shilajit. Yeah, um, yeah and good. It, it is a complex matrix, but it's, you know, it's still one that, you know, we do take on testing complex matrices, um, you know, because it's often those ingredients that are the things that really truly need to be tested or yep. to where there is more of a, a at least conceptual risk, you know. Mm. Testosterone boosters is a perfect example. Okay, if you look at the Australian Institute of Sport, um, and you know, uh, I just want to take a second and, and actually appreciate the work of the Therapeutic Goods Administration, uh, ASADA, and also mm. the Australian mm. Institute of Sport. Together, they do a very good job of trying to provide educational materials to athletes and sports mm. people. Um, yep. And I, I commend them for that. They push people to resources, mm. certification programs like mine that can protect athletes at the end of the day. So, mm. But the um, problem, it's, that, it's, I just while you're talking about it, there's a little problem that's come of because of that. Because of the TGA's obsession with regulation, they've actually, the Australian Institute of Sport now is shut down. So in Australia, the reality of it is, is the Therapeutic Goods Administration won't let the Australian Institute of Sport make any claims about any of their science and so the whole funding of their science because there's no commercial opportunities coming out of it because TGA won't let them make any therapeutic claims on natural substances so the Australian Institute of Sports gone from a dozen scientists down to one person part-time and they don't do any science now because of the over um, reaching of the TGA isn't yeah, that crazy that's, that's we went from being the best in the world and because when I talked to Rich you know, took Rich Kreider and uh, some of our mutual friends over in the States, and yeah. they were saying that their whole model, the Australian, no, sorry, the International Sports Society and Nutrition and that was set up a lot of their models based Society on the... Sports yeah, they, they, they set up a lot of their stuff based on the Australian Institute of Sports model. And now the Australian Institute of Sports model's all crumbled, and it's like quite sad. Well, okay, you know, you watch one of the reasons sport. I, in fact, said what I did, it's, mm. it's... I appreciated the groups in a way for tackling claims more so than some others might be willing to do mm. and it's you know i think we talked about performance enhancement before yes and you know supplements in general we're taking them to fuel the body or you know because of the claims that mm. are out there and it's yeah it would be nice to have bodies review those claims and provide more information, exactly not shrink away from doing it but, yeah, you know, they also don't want to be tied to those claims per se for liability reasons. And, yeah, exactly. You know, it's yeah. it's complex, but it's I, I appreciated them because of their mm. willingness to deal yeah. with those topics mm. to, you know, for their willingness to even deal with something like deer antler. You know, there's a giant yeah. piece of information. You know, I read it myself when considering deer antler for certification. And, you know, it's 60 some odd pages of information on deer antler. So, yeah. Brilliant, you know, you huh? really can educate yourself through that kind of material if you dig in. And it's hmm. they still have material that's, I mean, it's detailed and lengthy. Um, so ho hopefully they get some resources to keep that going. Yeah, so absolutely. Otherwise, we'll have to take over. Is really ATP will I take over. And that's what we try to you know put out ourselves. So I appreciate the opportunity to yeah. talk with yeah. you guys. And 
use this as a vehicle for it. So. I, I want to know more about these test boosters because this is this is the sort so of grey area that is confuses me because having uh, the testosterone testosterone, testosterone levels and and testosterone boosters because a natural testosterone booster a herbal material designed to ask your body to make more testosterone will only really only ever get you into that top end of the normal range it's really hard to use a natural substance to push you over the top um with the um and i'm going to get back more to a couple of other things you said before about dresses and pants and sensitivity but um <laughs> what so what's your theory about your test so with these test boosters I, I want to know what what's your thoughts of these test boosters. It's a very grey area because, I mean, I might test someone's testosterone levels and they might be high-end and normal. I might test a female's with testosterone levels with polycystic ovarian syndrome or, or something and they might have higher levels than a bloke. And then, uh, and then how does the herbs or uh, we're looking right. at I mean, anabolic steroids? Yeah. It's such a grey area. And really? is it that performance enhancing to have normal levels of testosterone? It's a really interesting area of science just to think about in general, right? I mean, hmm. testosterone boosting, or if you even want to consider yourself clinically low, okay, it's basically based on a range. 350 is essentially the level. If you're, you know, below that, you're low. If you're above that, you need testosterone. You know, hmm. I think your friends can tell you that it's not quite that simple. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's kind of how it's applied. And it's, you know, let's. Let's not forget this little tidbit that if you actually take an anabolic steroid, you drive down your own testosterone production mm, and actually, limit it. Yeah. And so there was a period of time where, you know, fighters were trying to get TUEs, therapeutic use exemptions for testosterone. And it's like the wink, wink, nod, nod. Did you drive your own testosterone down to need mm. this? Or, yeah, yeah. You know, so look, it's, it's testosterone, it's, it's, you know, the big steroid, yes, it's been yeah. responsible for more positive drug tests than any other drug out there by far for years uh, yeah. and will be forever. But here's the interesting thing about testosterone, okay? So today, uh, you know, and really looking into the language is interesting. You call it a gray area. I don't call it necessarily a gray area. So let me tell you why. Um, and, you know, BSEG, we certify natural testosterone booster products for the following reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so look, testosterone detection in sport comes down to first a TE ratio, testosterone to epitestosterone. If you go above four, that's sign of that you've used synthetic testosterone. Okay. Mm -hmm. They do a follow-up test called carbon isotope ratio. My father developed the carbon isotope ratio tests. 20 some odd years ago, I think, by now. And what carbon isotope ratio testing does is it looks at the carbon in the testosterone and tells you whether it's synthetic or natural. Hmm. Okay. And so hmm. from that, you determine whether or not synthetic testosterone has been applied. Yeah. Okay. Now you've, in more recent you know, times, you've introduced uh, testosterone profiling into sport drug testing. And so now, uh, much like you have blood testing for years where they track blood testing to look for EPO doping, they do the same for testosterone and they track your testosterone levels, but it's an indicator in the profile, Yeah. okay? They do target testing if they're concerned about it and they look for synthetic testosterone use. So I circle back and let me, let me say why I can unequivocally answer your question. So uh, I go back to the WADA list. There it is. Yep. And testosterone's banned under category S1 anabolic agents, and it falls under S1B, which are endogenous anabolic steroids. It means they're ah. present naturally in your body. Yeah. So here is a quote straight from the WADA list. Endogenous anabolic androgenic steroids and their metabolites and isomers, when administered exogenously, including but not limited to, and testosterone appears in that section. Okay? Yeah. So what the list said is actually the answer to the question. 
if you don't administer synthetic testosterone or natural testosterone exogenously, i.e. use natural testosterone, you're not doping. Okay? Yeah. And yeah. so it's not – if something has an effect in your body, to, to your point, Matt, to slightly mm. increase your testosterone levels – and, you know, I had a, a brand owner who sold t natural testosterone products, um, put it to me fairly well. OK, and mm -hmm. he was a 55 year old guy himself and he he was tested for testosterone and he was clinically low. Yeah. And he said, look, Oliver, I'd much rather take, you know, a natural herb that can help boost my own testosterone production. Yep. than to have to take the pharmaceutical drug testosterone, which, yeah. keep in mind, affects your own production of testosterone mm. a bit. Yeah. So it's, and that was a strong point, you know, it's, it, so yeah. that to me is really the answer in a nutshell. The WADA list says it, said as it itself yeah. uh, that mm. if you don't administer it exogenously, you're not doping. Yeah. If you, if you take a natural testosterone booster, uh, the testosterone that's being increased in your body is natural and it mm. will never come up positive on that carbon isotope ratio test that demonstrates that it's synthetic. So, Do you, yeah. do you want me to explain you know, just for listeners what, what isotope, carbon isotopes are? Or yeah, just uh, just very quickly, when you make testosterone, you make more of the, the type of carbon and it has more carbon-13 and carbon-14, which have slightly higher levels of, of neutrons in the atom. The carbon-12 is where those isotopes have been spent. So you'll find that the exogenous testosterones have higher levels of carbon-12. Just to get a bit of background chemistry, that's no, my understanding. I'm really that. glad you're putting it in. I'll, wait, I'll tell you uh, something else in a second. Great. Okay, I'll let you tell it. No, I just wanted, because I didn't know if people knew what isotopes were at all. So apart from the team in The Simpsons, the old... You know, the baseball team in The Simpsons, but uh, everyone knows the isotopes there. But I just didn't know if the average listener knew about isotopes. Well, look, I mean, so to that point, testosterone, you know, used to be made from a starting material in yams. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Dios, Dios genin. Yeah, being yeah. The plant sterile that's in yams, okay? And so if you think back to when, um, when Usain Bolt won his first Olympic gold medal, you remember what his father, his father was interviewed about his secret sauce afterwards. You remember what he said? No, what? no. What did he say? He said it was the yams. Oh, <laughs> wow. He was already covering. He had a disclaimer out right well, at the start. my mind went was, yeah. is, is that, <laughs> so I'm really glad you put it. That's funny, that, that because in. in Australia, we we had it, in Australia, everyone was using progesterone cream at yeah, one stage, which cream. was, but that was the sterols from the wild yam was used to make progesterone. But then that wasn't allowed in Australia, but they could have wild yam in Australia. So everyone used to bring in the progesterone cream, but just call it wild yam mm. cream. But then what happened is all these Australian companies started selling, actually selling wild yam cream, which is, if anything, has an estrogenic effect um, when applied as wild yam, you know. So that's funny how these, these sort of things happen. But when you're talking about that testosterone, so... Most of the time, if someone gets called a drug cheat because they've found that they've shown positive for excessive levels of testosterone or a metabolite or some evidence that they've cheated with testosterone. So what you're saying is using a natural test booster, a herbal material that kind of asks your body to make more uh, by, by just working through the pituitary gland or working through the, the andro natural androgen production pathways in the body, those sort of things only ever get the testosterone up to a certain point but it's also in a form that we should be able to tell if it's endogenous or not. Mm. You should be able to tell if someone's um, testosterone and metabolites is naturally occurring that they've made it themselves or if it's come from... Could you tell if it's come from pro-hormones or could you mm. tell if it's come um, from other steroids? Unfortunately, you can't quite get that specific with the testing. Mm. You, know, you see the increase in the downstream you know, hormone in question. And many mm. of them metabolize to you know common you know steroids as a whole so it's hard yeah. to point where they started um you know but you can you can see a little bit in levels you know if you mm. are really using testosterone your te ratio might be more like 15 or above whereas mm. if you're taking a natural testosterone booster you know it, it, you know and it also depends on where you start my dad did a, a study 
uh, as part of the development of the TE ratio and the, the modification of it in carbon isotope ratio, where he took a, a couple thousand college students and he did a bell curve to see, you know, where the TE ratio fell within that. And that yeah. was part of the science that was used to adjust the TE ratio over time. So hmm. when we started sport drug testing, it was a 10 to 1 ratio. It moved to 6 to 1, and now it's at 4 to 1, as we've understood more about the natural testosterone levels and ratios uh, yeah. between testosterone and epitestosterone. So it's, hmm. look, if your natural TE ratio is 1, you know, you're probably not going to move your TE ratio over 3 to 1 if you take a natural testosterone booster, so you aren't yeah. even going to trip that first issue. And okay. it's, you know, but I don't, athletes, to your point earlier, um, if they even think they're doping, it's a concern to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, many of these people are very ethical sports people. They don't want to oh, go yeah. near drugs banned in sport. How and not? so, you know, the Australian Institute of Sport, for example, uh, has testosterone boosters as a whole uh, categorized as group D. In group mm. D, you know, they've got four different groups that they sort of put supplements in to try to categorize and educate people. Yeah. And group D is the most risky group. Okay? Yeah, wow. And it's yeah. so even within their scheme in as best, you know, as well meaning mm. as it is, it's still difficult to deal with that category of supplement because it's so close to testosterone. I'm going to throw another element in. Associated with it, you know? I want to screw around with you a little bit more because <laughs> oh, while yeah. we're talking about this testosterone thing, <laughs> in Australia we've gone through we've gone through a bit of a, a rainbow era of transgender neutralness um, okay. and and and, I, and I'm aware of a few things that I've seen from America and that sort of stuff as well. But have you come? Have you, have you had any experience with like males and females, you know, uh, changing their sexual orientation and then choosing to compete in a sport with the opposite well, sex? And 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 how the hell are we? Is there now going to be? Is there different levels of testosterone for men and women as an acceptable range before you're a drug cheat? You're, you're getting into an area that's, I mean, really interesting and really difficult to deal yeah. with for a number of reasons. And it's, you know, look, there, there's, I think you put this issue into two different realms. And my father was involved in actually writing some of the IOC papers that really had to deal with this issue in reality. And they're still confronting it, you know, right now, particularly in track and field. Um, and mm. they're they're confronting the reality of testosterone limits for naturally born hermaphrodites who are born with you know some set of both equipment and yeah. with high natural testosterone production levels. And I mean, this is natural. Yeah, there's a certain, yeah. You know, Steve can probably talk about it better than me from a medical standpoint because I'm not a doctor. But there's a certain number of people born you know that way every year and it's yeah. you know we can't exclude them from sport um yeah. and it's so figuring out how to deal with that immensely personal and difficult you know arena is it's hard yeah it's, we started to tiptoe towards you know testosterone limits and they started to require you know people that are are in that realm um, you know, true hermaphrodites to to take drugs to lower their yeah, testosterone right. in order and to block this. Yeah. And yeah. it's I understand that in my mind, but I I don't think that's fair at the end of the day to an athlete and a human being, hmm. you know, on a human level. Um, but it's it's stuff we have to deal with in sport. Yeah. They dealt with that in the LPGA. Yep. Um, and they had to confront, you know, how long between, you know, the other part of this equation is people that elect to, to you know, change their sex. And yeah. And that's yeah. A, a more difficult question. It's could you change your sex for, you know, for gain in sport? Yeah, could just you, to get a world record you know, or something. Could you somehow, if you're male, become a female fighter? 
and be much more successful in female fighting. In yeah. The LPGA, you know, can you hit the ball farther because you've got, you know, a different, you know, you know, genetic makeup. Hmm. And it's, hmm. you know, those are interesting questions. Oh. I dealt with it, you know, in a way, in, in a time period, you know, a time frame lapse in some of those questions. But it's, however you answer the question, there's always going to be questions that remain and there's always going to be difficult elements of it. There's yeah, a lot yes. of those questions in fight sport where it's, is it fair to have people fight each other? You know, is it fair to have a man fight a woman? You know, hmm. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's funny because you seen... did okay. So <laughs> yeah, in, in Australia, we, we got a weird era where regardless of anatomy, physiology, if you choose to identify mm. at the risk of offending someone, you have to kind of let them play. Mm. You know, but I mean, so if we then set a limit of what's an acceptable level of testosterone, where it's a neutral playing field between men and women, where you've then got a, what you just suggested is some people have to suppress their natural levels to be uh, even playing field well that goes back to your initial start where you said there's three reasons to ban a substance one of them could do harm that's not helping anyone's health by blocking a natural level of hormone that they need now would that then be more fair to allow the people with the low levels to supplement to get up to an even playing field yeah, there's, there's also so this is where it gets a no, a no needle policy and you've got to inject those kinds of things yeah i mean it's see the race horses we used to do a lot of work with racehorses and we'd spell them. Like we'd just go, I'm going to juice you. you know, we'd have a horse that's kind of you know, not real flash. They'd put it out and say, oh, we're going to retire the horse, put it out in the paddock for six months. We do three months of gear, build a giant new horse, bring it back. They come clean, but the, the, ho the, the frame has been built. Mm. And it's the frame that they, if they can maintain that frame and be, have an extra advantage and still pass a drug test. Like that, sure, I mean, it's... <laughs> There's the realm of genetic doping and so forth, and you know genetics are big in uh, in polo these yeah. days, and it's one of the realms where they you know have remade the same famous polo punny over and over and over again. And yeah, I can't remember wow. the guy, but he rides the same horse in a cloned form, you know, every race, and it's <laughs> that's you know, crazy. We're starting to deal with you know early early forms of genetic doping in humans as well. Okay, yeah. and what what you're starting to see in our realm is. It's actually in and around the realm of myostatin inhibitors. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. The earliest form of sort of genetic doping. And so what they've started to do uh, in genetic circles in doping is they take a, an inactive virus and they take a, a substance like folostatin. Okay, folostatin is a naturally present substance. It's in egg yolks um, and so forth. Um, but folostatin is also uh, has an effect as a myostatin inhibitor. Inhibitor, yeah. Okay, and you know it, you know it boosts your muscle. All right. So in, in simplest terms, um, mm. so myostatin inhibitors are you know it's a category of WADA prohibited substance. It's a newer category where there happen to not be very many examples uh, until this year when folostatin became one of the first examples of a, of a banned, uh, you know, drug in that category. There's a few other proteins that qualify. But hmm. if you look hmm. at, you know, this example, the reason it was banned was because folostatins hooked to a virus and injected in your body, and it replicates, and that's how you get the myostatin inhibition wow. functionality. Okay. But... The dietary supplement industry has also come along, and there is a product on the market that is made from activated folostatin uh, and some other ingredients um, that's actually certified by one of our competitors, uh, yeah. which is really interesting to think about with yeah. folostatin just becoming a banned substance in sport. And it's it's really it's another example of. Uh, the imperfections in our realm. You might ask, how in the world can one of my competitors certify folostatin or, or a supplement that contains it if it's on the water prohibited list? Yeah. You know, the and answers this, it are starts... in the forms and the types mm. of the products that you take. And, yeah. And you know what you're taking. So it's 
you know, honestly, it's there's so many different examples of myostatin inhibitors. It's, look, one of the biggest ones in the dietary supplement realm today is green tea extract. Mm, yeah. Okay. Epicatechins from green tea. And you'll literally see products, you know, epicat right below it on the, the function panel. They'll say myostatin inhibitor. Mm. So is that make that a banned substance in sport? Yeah. Well, by name, yes. Mm. By interpretation, yes. By function, even, yes. Yeah, but, but the chemical, no. By, by urine tests, no. Yeah. yeah. Why? Because they're not testing for the drugs or yeah. the constituents of green tea extract. And yeah. therein is, is why I have a job probably for a long time, because interpreting that stuff is challenging, and it's there's constantly stuff coming from the natural product realm that is pushing the limits and trying to push into new categories of banned substances, not even purposely because they're banned substances, but yeah, because they may have some kind of benefit to your body. Yeah, it's a lot of these things are being made for anti-aging, for muscle wasting disorders and things along those lines. Hmm. And it's, you know, the problem with pro hormones is that they had a potential to cause liver failure and some of these, you know, some serious harmful effects. Well, you know, with an epicatechin, or some of these other things, you don't see those levels of harm. Mind you, we really need to do studies on the upper limits and toxicity, and that's not always done. And you yeah. can push the limits and push the dosing, and it's, you know, I don't want to see, you know, 10,000 milligram doses of epicatechin products out there, you know. No. Usually they're out there in like 300 milligrams. But, um, you know, it's, take a substance like theobromine. Yeah. All right. Theobromine's a natural chemical in chocolate. Chocolate. Yep. Yeah. And but now you're also seeing as as the stimulant product realm has developed, now you see products that are 98% theobromine. And yeah. And so whereas you know chocolate or cocoa extracts might be 20%. Yeah. So have you just taken a weak stimulant and turned it into a strong one? You kind of have by dosing. Not yeah. by the nature of the actual chemical, but we've got to think about that too, and what we allow or don't allow, and in formulas yeah. and, and so forth. So all that yeah, goes yeah. into our thinking and process. And it goes into, like you were saying, for the spirit, you know, the spirit of competing, and mm -hmm. are we cheating and that sort of stuff. You met, um, uh, in Australia again. Um, I, I don't want to keep giving an example because we would talk forever on this because it's just so much, and I, I love these kind of weird discussions where it's like. <laughs> You know, we realize at the end of it, we're left with, I'll eat more questions. But yeah. in Australia, well, I noticed in America, everyone's bloody doing CBD. Now, in Australia, CBD is not um, very well regulated in the sense that it's a typical. We get the it's highly regulated parts that they want to use for drugs, and then we get the guys making their own hash oil in the backyard <laughs> and selling it with a CBD label. How did you know? <laughs> I saw you, Steve. <laughs> but that, um, he brought it back from Nimbin, What's that, in that drink Mardi Gras. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, now, a lot of my, my understanding is a lot of the re original data was looking at the THC, the narcotic or the hallucinogenic component of it had a lot of the really good benefits were coming from the THC. The CBD's got a lot of pain relief and anti-inflammatory, but I'm thinking there's probably a lot of CBD products or a lot of products out there labelled CBD that may also have THC and that sort of stuff in it. What what what's the regulatory status for? Are these now gone from recreational drugs to performance enhancing drugs or something? Uh, no, I wouldn't put it quite there. I mean, CBD is enormously interesting. I mean, it's one of the fastest growing you know product categories out there today. Uh, hmm. You've got to be blind to not see it. It's in cosmetics, beauty shops. Yeah. You know, Coca Cola is you know thinking of getting involved with it and so forth. And it's wow. I mean, people everyone wants to know about CBD and it's obviously it's it's got a draw to athletes because one of the benefits that's talked about the most is you know pain management uh, mm. particularly as far as you know chronic pain management is concerned so you know it's got other benefits talked about it like mm. you know focus or things like that it's mm. you know performance enhancement muscle building you know not so much but you know keep in mind this is a category that's sort of developing and a lot of the research is also developing. So, you know, 
I think people mm. will look at different formulations and combinations and so forth as time progresses and spend time doing the clinical studies to, to deal with it. Now, mm. you know, athletes, sports people, consumers, I mean, even consumers are subject to workplace drug testing. And to mm. your point, they don't want to take too much THC while they want mm. to benefit from CBD. So yeah. looking at the industry, it's it's so THC and CBD both come from cannabis, the cannabis plant. Mm. OK, and cannabis comes in two two primary forms, marijuana, the the, the devil weed that people have been after for years <laughs> and yeah. hemp. OK, yeah. and hemp is the industrial product that is grown for rope and and uh, what happens, you know, they, yeah. So, you know, hemp has been grown for years, even in the U.S. You know, we grew it back when the country was founded. And they say, you know, the dollar or, you know, whatever else. The original one was printed on hemp or whatever. They say. Yeah, yeah, right. So, I mean, it is a big part of our, our agricultural you know, history. Uh, hmm. But obviously, because of the marijuana and THC component and the psychoactive effects that come with it, it got stigmatized and controlled and so forth. And so the hemp side of the industry is still suffering. Yeah. Hemp, within the last decade, you've seen the CBD product, explode, you know, industry explode. And mm. CBD is a non-psychoactive cannabinoid present in cannabis. So mm. the primary difference between hemp and marijuana is hemp species are grown to be low in THC and high, usually high in CBD. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, hemp according to agricultural production, is limited by the percentage of THC that it can have. So you can't lo legally grow hemp over a certain percent. In yeah. the U.S., it's 0.3%. In the EU, it's 0.2%. Um, and so that's what defines a, a product that is made from legal hemp. But it doesn't just stop there for an athlete or someone that's drug tested, because the percent mm. doesn't define how much you take on a daily yep. dose basis. And mm. so we're, we're actually incredibly proud. We've brought this program to market, Certified, Certified hemp. hemp. Yeah, Ooh, right. right. So we really, you know, we recognize the product category and the interest in it. Um, mm -hmm. We had recognized that it was relatively unregulated. And we really wanted to be one of the first third party certification providers to offer, you know, a quality control testing scheme, a premium quality control testing scheme to the industry. Yep. And yeah, good. We've done that on our foundation, which is banned substances in sport and ultimately protecting athletes and others from positive drug tests. And so we've devised a way to do that for hemp and CBD products by limiting the amount of THC that is ingested on a daily dose basis. And so yeah. we've looked at the research, the published studies that are available, and we've selected our thresholds very, very conservatively so that you would be well below any threshold that's used in either workplace or sport drug testing. So yeah. um, we're very excited about the program. We've certified our first product in 4.5 CBD. Uh, we've got some others coming down yeah. the pipe. And it's, you know, we include testing for our full list of water prohibited substances. Yeah. We verify how much of the cannabinoids are present. We test for heavy metals, pesticides, solvents, and micro. And oh, do a great. GMP audit. So it's we really verify that the, the products we're certifying are premium quality and have been made with good quality control systems in place. And at the end of the day, we check it with our own testing. So it's, it's amazing. exciting to be part of that industry. But there's countless questions within the sporting realm, you know, about it. And it, it, it really comes down to urine testing thresholds yep. in sport. And hey. I, I want to stir you up, I think. So with do one I. Thing. But after I want that. to ask you this question, but you don't have to answer, okay? <laughs> or we can edit out if you like think we we'll probably all get shot. But I'm a little bit skeptical about a couple of th things that are happening in the world at the moment. You know, I look at some of this CRISPR technology when you're talking about gene stuff before, that scares the hell out of me. But I don't like seeing certain groups and that sort of stuff take over so much control. I start to think there's potential for corruption and that sort of thing but i look at from australia you know we regulated tga for zans all that sort of stuff but you know we get all these emails and marketing material for like nsf certification you know like we do the gmp manufacturer we have the hazard we have all that there's like this 
NSF certification that they believe will, you know, supersede GMP or something. And then, then I also see this NSF certification for a different version of genetically modified foods. So you got the non-GMO project, you got non-GMO verification, and there's a lot of genetically modified ingredients that are allowed into that non-GMO one with the NSF certification. And I, I think I heard something that there might be a deal going between WADA and NSF, where NSF is going to be the taking over all the certifications for WADA as well. So how could uh, one group then be the certifier for good manufacturing practices, then and then, you know, I, I certified that you made that well, and then also then be the certifier if the product tested with a contaminated, <coughs> excuse me, with a contamination or something. Now, is this, are you a bit nervous about how some groups like that could come in and take over so much power within a certification? You know, it's supposed I mean, to be independent. In a, sen yeah? in a sense, to me, it's actually somewhat exciting uh, yeah. in a way, and it might be odd to put it that way, but it's, you know, we're part of a relatively small industry of third-party certification, yeah? And mm -hmm. NSF certified for sport is one of our, our colleagues, Informed Sport is out there doing what they do, Hosta in yeah. Australia, Cologne List in Germany, um, you know, ourselves, BSEG in the U.S., um, and it's you're seeing growth of third party certification because there's more interest in premium quality and in, you know, verifying, you know, the truth behind the marketing and, and verifying label claims and making sure that people aren't, you know, putting in banned substances. And to me, mm. it's you know, that's what I want to see from my industry is it grow and the importance of it continue to grow, you know, in the world. And it's it's. You know, it's uh, what I would say about systems is that it's impossible to build a perfect system. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, the WADA system is not perfect. There mm -hmm. is no mm -hmm. perfect third party dietary supplement certification program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mine included. Um, but we, what I do want to see is everybody doing, you know, the best that they can to do the job at hand. And, you know, NSF does, a do, does do a good job in our realm of banned substance mm. certification. I consider them a leader in the realm. Informed Sport is a leader in the realm. Mm. Um, and really what it comes down to with dietary supplement certification, and this is important to athletes at the end of the day, yeah. is what are you testing for? What's your testing menu? Mm. What level can you detect in that, your detection limits? Um, what frequency of batches are tested? Okay, uh, and how is that represented to a consumer or an athlete? Mm. Um, and and so you know, those are really the important elements. Okay. You know that I see, yeah. and really at the end of the day, the most important thing to an athlete is to test a product in a specific individual lot number, uh, and make sure that that lot number that's stamped on the product package has been tested yeah. through a reputable program. And, and that's a great a point, that, because what people need to realize is if you've got to, it's batch testing. There's not like a product that's been tested and shown to be clean or a brand. You've got to go to the, some of these databases and actually review the batch number and make sure that the batch you're taking was the one that was tested and shown to be clean, mm. if you, you want to have any. You absolutely yeah. do, and that's why you mm. also need to pay attention to the, the testing body's batch testing frequency. Okay. Yeah. In our program, we test either every batch or we have a monthly option. In Informed yep. Sport, they test every batch. Informed Choice is a monthly option. Hmm. Okay. okay. And it's you've got to understand that with each testing scheme that you're involved with uh, and scrutinize it. You hmm. know, in the case of NSF, they do very good technical work, but they don't disclose the batch testing frequency publicly. And in some cases, they list products with the word all in their database when, in fact, a subset of batches may be tested. So yeah, okay. yeah. You know, you've got to be a little bit careful about those kinds of things. And you've got to be, you know, honest and frank about it from our standpoint as a certification provider. Mm. I mean, right on my database, the last sentence says, if a lot number is not listed, it has not been certified. Hmm. And it's we go to that length to sit there and communicate with athletes hmm. when they're checking our database just to make sure they're they're you know getting a product that's been certified. And, and that, that's on your web page. Like, the, is there is there like a 
a database where they're all found or do we have to go to the NSF page or your page or the HASTA page or where do we find, where would an athlete find this information or would they go sure, back to you, the manufacturer and ask you, us? You know, me? ultimately the best thing is to go to the actual certification provider site and verify the lot number in the actual database. We yeah, all have yeah. a lot number field where you just put in the search and it'll, it'll pick that product out or you yep. can look at it by name or whatever you want. But you definitely mm. need to take that step uh, for any supplement that you're considering. And it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's one of the most important things an athlete can, mm. can do for themselves. Even a product that has a seal has some sm slight, pro you know, slight yeah. risk yeah. Of, of having some contamination. Presence. And can I ask you a question, just, yeah. just very broadly and very quickly, I know look, I'd love to talk all day about this, but I think for the last hour and a half, we've kind of scared a lot of professional athletes that may be wanting to be, you know, they can, they can get contaminated from my right, whatever, right, right. Uh, colostrum or whatever. Uh, what would you recommend to the average athlete, that, say I'm a supreme athlete, like it's, uh, it's uh, easy to imagine, I guess, just looking at me, um, yes. but say I'm a performance athlete and I'm worried that I, my supplements or whatever, would, I, would you recommend to that athlete hey, go and get your urine test or some sort of test now just to be sure to make sure you're not doing anything wrong right now. Is that a recommendation that you would give or have you got another, uh, any advice for the professional athlete out there who wants to be clean? Sure, no, and that's, that's I think, a great way for us to sort of conclude. I mean, there's a number of good supplement products out there that are quality products that are not going to be a problem for anybody. We've been talking mm. about the small risks that are associated with them and where the issues may come from. But, you know, the vast bulk of products that are on the market are not contaminated and don't have these issues. It's, you know, for an athlete, though, you can't have any questions at the end of the day. So you want an easy process mm -hmm. of understanding that a product is going to be acceptable for me to use and minimizing the risk of any contamination. And really, you know, it starts in a couple ways. You know, number one, we always advise people to work with qualified sport nutritionists, mm. uh, doctors, and people like that to discuss dietary supplements, how you can put th them together to benefit you, uh, so you you know you can really uh, get a good supplement routine that's going to be helpful to you, mm. as opposed to just sampling all kinds of stuff. Mm. So you know, get your guidance. Those people, your sport nutritionists from International Society of Sport Nutrition and other groups, you know, college and professional sport dietitians, National Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association, those types of people have the additional expertise to review products um, and labels and so forth a little bit better than your average athlete. Mm. <clears throat> so definitely do that. Look for reputable supplement brands, uh, brands that participate in third party certification programs are always going above and beyond the rest of the industry from the standpoint of quality control. Mm. So, you know, those are good brands for athletes to look for. <clears throat> and really, mm. you know, what we try to do is take the work off the athlete. Yeah. Mm. If mm. our seals on there, you shouldn't have to review the ingredients because yeah. we've done that. You don't have to be worried about it being contaminated because we've tested it to the best of our abilities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, third party certification is, is more and more important and it, it really just creates that peace of mind, not just for the consumer and the athlete, but, mm -hmm. you know, for the brand knowing that they're going to be able to continue to develop uh, without, you know, issues along the way. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, we're really happy to be where we are. And, you know, I think hopefully people get a little bit of a sense through this discussion of, the types of the, the group we are and, and you know our willingness to really talk about the issues and take the time to get into them and and you know that's really what what i enjoy a lot of is is getting into that and, and helping to decipher them uh, yeah. so there is more understanding about dietary supplements and natural products and the good that they can do without you know this sort of worry looking over your shoulder mm. so mm. 
And the athlete doesn't need that sort of worry. They want to be focused mm. on doing what they do well, Playing which is tennis. being an athlete. Yeah, yeah. And then companies like us that do our own manufacture and do all the third-party testing can give them that peace of mind that mm. they can just confident. Because we can even walk them back through the facilities. They're not even to ban substances out here, let alone potentially getting onto one of our conveyor belts. Um, so I, I think that's probably a good place to wrap it up. I, mm. I think, I, I, like I said, I've got, I got so many notes here of other stuff I want to talk to you yeah. about and other little... <laughs> But I, I'm like that. I just want to keep asking these stupid When's part questions. Two? And, um, <laughs> yeah, we'll do but, part two whenever you're ready. Yeah, we'll have to come back and do some more, I think. Um, thank you so much for your time, Oliver. Oh, it was oh. really great. I know. This is awesome. I just want to keep talking about so it. But I. we'll do more another time, I another think. Another time. Yeah. My pleasure. I'd love to. I mean, it's it's. I really do like getting into this stuff. And it's. I've lived it, you know. It's. Mm. I can mm. pull countless examples out, you know, that. that Really, at the end of the day, it's the real world of dietary supplements and what matters to athletes and what doesn't. And, yeah, and, you know. So we're we're really happy to be where we are, and and you know, and having the ability to you know do some good and and really you know help the image of the dietary supplement industry and really help to to boost it. And yeah, create that you know trust at the consumer and athlete level on these types of products. So. No, I think it's fascinating. Well, thanks, for Oliver, for your your time yeah, today, but awesome. also what you're doing for the industry. I yeah. really I think it's going to make it all better. So, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, no worries. Thanks, thanks Oliver. Oliver. See you, mate. Bye. Have a great day. <laughs>